Good morning. It's Monday, July 28th, 2014, and this is Tech Talk Today, episode 33. My name is Chris, and you know, I bet you didn't know, in 1997, Dell announced its entry into the workstation market with the Workstation 400 on July 28th, 1997. But the other thing that you might not have realized, or you probably did know this one, this is the last week of July, my friends, for 2014. Can you believe that? Can you believe we're already at the end of July? That's incredible. And to help me sort of get through the last week, as it were, because let's let's face it, summer's going by too fast. I am joined by an esteemed group in our mumble room. Hello, mumblers. You guys ready for the headlines Good today? Morning. Good morning. Good morning, Chris. Good afternoon. Hello. Oh, hi, guys. Good to have you here today. So, hey, you know, a company we haven't talked about for a few weeks here on Tech Talk today is really kind of dominating the headlines this morning, and it's Amazon. And uh, get ready for this. Buckle up. Change change everything you know about Amazon. <laughs> uh, because they're set to launch a Square competitor in August and also a biometric payment solution. Amazon could be preparing this launch of its own credit card payment system with its own hardware in coming weeks. This is according to internal staple documents that were leaked to 9to5Mac.com. According to these documents, you'll have an Amazon card reader alongside an existing card reader from Staples, PayPal, and Staples' own in-brand, all sold at Staples stores and, of course, Amazon.com. The small hardware, which will connect to a smartphone to process payments, will cost $9.99, and according to Staples' internal sales systems. An exact launch date of the product is unconfirmed, but Staples has asked its stores to wait until Tuesday, August 12th, to put the new single, or I'm sorry, the new signage related to the Amazon card reader. So it's possible we could see something that week. Amazon getting the payment systems is right to compete with Square, PayPal, obviously uh, Google Wallet. I would assume Apple's probably working in this area. Um, you know, at first I was pretty skeptical because I feel like the further Amazon gets away from their core business, the less I like what they do. And it seems like they just, I feel like they just need to be in everything. At the same time, Amazon actually has a pretty robust payment system they have available for websites already to use. Like They're also the back-end payment processor for sites like Kickstarter. So they kind of already have a system in place. I, I was thinking about it in terms of like my mom, who, uh, who does uh, graphic arts for, on the computer and Photoshop and Illustrator and you know all the Adobe suite of products. She's huge into it. And her whole career is around making all this stuff. And now she's gone and transitioned in more of an independent role, an independent artist where she's selling it directly at like restaurants and art events and things like that. And she's using Square right now on an iPhone to do that. And I think she would probably prefer to use Amazon because she trusts that Amazon name. When, when she opted to get Square, unbeknownst to me, like she did some research on it, but she was still kind of trepidatious about just buying some little thing called Square and putting it on her iPhone and then swiping credit cards. But Amazon... Oh, I know Amazon, right? Everybody buys from Amazon. Amazon's safe. Amazon's secure. What do you guys think in the mumble room? Would you try out, uh, if you were, say, to doing a garage sale, $9.99, you can get a payment processor. People coming to your garage sale could pay for stuff at your garage sale using an Amazon payments account or something like that. Here, I've got two points that I want to make about this one. First of all, the the first point is, yes, absolutely. Amazon's a well-known name. People trust Amazon for whatever reason. I don't know. But... <laughs> It, they're cheap, it sounds dude. to me like, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I'm a cheap guy. I, I, I will gladly buy from Amazon. And Prime, man, uh, everybody loves Prime. Really, this is why. Oh yeah. Bezos is this is this is Bezos's is, uh, ethos is make it cheap. Uh, always try to be consumer friendly. Then you will build trust, and they have done it very successfully. Oh yeah, and you know the the other thing, the point I want to make is Bezos named to Amazon specifically so so that it wouldn't be locked down into one thing that he could branch it out into multiple things like this instead of just the books or what have you so he's doing a good job there this looks like their amazon i'm sorry amazon <laughs> this looks like their answer to google wallet as well as square and paypal and all those other places um is it going too far, though? Uh, Josh, what do you think? Is, is Does Amazon just need to simmer down? Now they've got a smartphone, they've got an e-reader, they've got a tablet, they've got an app store. Now they have a payment processing system. Is, is Amazon just trying to be everything to everybody? 
Definitely. You know, we already have Dwalla. We already have PayPal. We already have Google Wallet. We already have Square. Do we really need <laughs> yet another payment option? Oh, and not to mention, we also have Coinbase and we also have Moolah and a million other different payment providers. I just don't see the need for another one. Can we just actually come up with some standards rather than creating even more? Uh, do you think, though, that Amazon has the option of being the the, the neutral party? Because you got Google Wallet, like you said, Visa, MasterCard, they're going to have their own. Every every major cell phone company will eventually try to be a payment processor. A lot of them are in other countries like already. Maybe Amazon could be that neutral third party that works on iOS, works on Android, works on the uh, you know, the the uh, all of the all of the platforms, all Windows Phone, all of them. Maybe that makes them the more approachable for developers because I don't have to get locked into a particular platform vendor. Well, sure you do. You'd be getting locked into uh, Amazon's payment system. Yeah, <laughs> very true, <laughs> very true. Uh, while we're on the Amazon thread, unless anybody else had any other notes on the payment system. Uh, yeah, I, I was just playing devil's advocate there, chat room. <laughs> I was like, come on, really, Chris? No, no, really. I was just <laughs> just throwing it out there. Uh, I want to talk a little bit, though, about something else that also comes with a fair amount of lock-in. Everybody knows about EC2 and Amazon's cloud service and how hardcore Amazon's rocking that market. And uh, kind of a stroke of genius from Amazon. I think one of their best moves ever. You know, they had this huge infrastructure they needed to run their own e-commerce services and then when they had additional capacity, they began renting that out, realized there was a business there. And instead of being like, oh, no, no, we shouldn't do that, they just seized on it like a dog with a bone. And you really got to respect that. And, and here's what it's gotten them. Yesterday, uh, so this would be, I believe, Friday this report ran, uh, Amazon said its cloud business grew by 90% last year. However, huge but, significantly less profitable. Amazon's AWS cloud business makes up the majority of the balance sheet in the other category on their uh, financials. That also goes with their credit card and advertising revenues also in the other category. Uh, and that revenue from that line of business grew by 38%. So business has grown by 90%. Revenue has grown by 38%. The quarter before that, it grew by 60%. So in other words, Amazon has transitioned now into a pretty steadily trend where they're piling on customers faster than they're generating revenue and adding money to the bottom line. So the company's chief financial officer, he blamed the drop in substantial price reductions that the company had to make to products such as its core EC2 storage and database services. Direct quote says, they ranged from a 28% to 51% cut depending on the service. Uh, and of course, that's to stay comp uh, competitive with Google Compute and Azure but the thing is, is even as Amazon's business matures to the size of a company like VMware, it's starting to worry investors of Amazon who see the profitability slipping, just like so many other of Amazon's categories. They start to make money, and over time, they've begun to lose, to lose money. That's pretty much the meta-narrative of Amazon as a whole, though, which is it could lose as much as 100 and... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 810 million in the current quarter. The company is taking losses to invest in the future, and as Amazon's 10% stock drop today shows some of its investors are uncomfortable with that. And actually, now the total as of the end of day on Friday was stocks were down 11% after this news. I think this is an interesting thing that people need to realize about Amazon is they are not so much like your traditional startup, right? Jeff Bezos wasn't some scrappy guy from a garage who got together and like somehow miraculously created one of the world's number one online retailers. Jeff Bezos was working at an investment firm who was buddies with a bunch of bankers. The banker said, well, we have literally an S ton of money, Jeff, and you're a smart guy. What could you come up with? Here, Jeff, here's billions of dollars. Go create something. They locked down on the book market because they felt like that was an area ripe for disruption. And I don't mean to take credit from Bezos and his crew because if they actually were incredibly genius about some of the way they approach some of this stuff. So there was genuine innovation and, and genius that happened. But I think you got to understand the genesis of Amazon to kind of have a little bit of a picture on how they work and how they really are in a way just going after a market and really kind of relentlessly don't care about profits right now because they're backed by 
banks and investors. So they are, they're in a long-term game here to intentionally disrupt existing business models to replace them because once they figure they've gotten all that turf, then they'll finally be able to make money. And now they're taking that same approach in the cloud. But see, the problem with the cloud approach is it's a race to the bottom. And, and you look at companies like Microsoft and Google, they can play this game just as well as Amazon can. And they're going to just be able to crank that storage down, crank that bandwidth price down, keep moving it down and down and down. Uh, and this is going to be one of these interesting things where, I mean, what happened to the netbook, netbook market when we had a race to the bottom? Eventually, everybody got out. And I don't know if I like the idea of cloud services being the cheapest you can find. That doesn't seem really a great idea when you want security and privacy and good maintenance. So you can see how maybe some services, like Rackspace and others, who will continue to have very premium pricing, but then include a whole bunch of support, might actually have the better strategy long term. Don't know. But, wow. If history repeats itself like it did with the netbook market, that means we're going to see cloud services die. If you or really consolidate, right? Maybe it'll be or, less of them. Yeah. Because you still yeah, have some exactly. like netbooks, but now they're more like Chromebooks. I mean, it's not a one-to-one analogy, but they kind of transformed. They didn't go away completely, but they weren't, they weren't that exploding market that everybody thought was going to be the future for a long time. Well, then let think, me ask this. Yeah. What do you see cloud services turning into if it does transform? Well, I think what you'll see is companies, I think you'll see a bigger shift to companies like Google and uh, Microsoft who are going to sort of focus more of their core business on that. And as a result of their other business, they just happen to produce data centers. Like Amazon does that too, but not at the same level that like uh, Google, Google has the most amazing computing infrastructure in the history of humanity. And I don't see anybody competing with that for a very long time. You see, one of the things Google did early on is they were really smart about buying up fiber. And Google owns a ton of fiber. Like a lot of people like Microsoft and Apple and Amazon, w- when they have to communicate between data centers, right, they go over like a level three provider or they go over some interconnect, right? And Google does that too in some cases. But in a lot of cases, especially in the U.S., Google owns all of the fiber between one data center to the other. That means all of the transit between their data centers is totally free. Nobody's tolling that. It's fiber. You know, I mean, it's really... So Google has a fantastical infrastructure advantage. And how do you compete with that? Because Google also is making a ton of money from a lot of other businesses, mainly advertising. So it... Yeah. And I, well, I can also see Microsoft doing something like that because, I mean, look at Nadella. He came from their cloud infrastructure right. division. Yeah. So that that's going to be their main focus. It's just inevitable. Yeah. And the other thing that Microsoft has there is they can provide that software bridge from your traditional IT shop that has some Windows and some IIS and some SQL and some SharePoint and some Exchange on-premises. Well, Azure is going to come along and say, well, you want to start putting some of that up in the cloud? Like maybe you want to move your SharePoint up into the cloud or maybe you want to move your SQL up there for your mobile dev- for your mobile users. Uh, they're going to, you know, that's going to be such an easy transition that people won't even consider EC2 for that kind of stuff. And there's so much of that out there still. Like all this talk about Google Apps and Office 365, the users, the amount of users of those systems pale in comparison to all of the physical installations and all of the small businesses, medium businesses, and large businesses and enterprises all over the world. And those users eventually are going to go somewhere. And I think when that major transition happens, and they're always way, 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 way behind the trend, right? These are people still using XP. They're way behind the trend. But when that transition starts to happen, I don't know if they're going to EC2. I think EC2 has been propped up by the app boom. It's been propped up by Easy Linux. You know, really simple Ubuntu spin up. Boom, boom, boom. You got it. But the thing is, oh, that's not a that's not an exclusive win anymore. A lot of people have that. Even Azure has that now. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. I mean, the thing with uh, with Microsoft and enterprises is developers and enterprises are hooked on tools like Visual Studio, and the fact that Visual Studio has it integrated where you essentially in one click can put pu- like push your application to an Azure instance that it'll spin up yeah. for you. Why why would why would they have to go with something like EC2 and you know have to figure out maybe compatibility stuff right. or you know maybe some half baked solution with Google right. Apps you know well, and they could just with one click so push to that's another that, boy great point because the other thing that kind of, kind of complements that that sort of software suite where it's just one click published to Azure is on the other end you've also got Microsoft has a you know 
tens of thousands of salespeople that come in and 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 sell and offer enterprises with Azure credit. So hey, you want to try out Azure? Here it is, six months, absolutely free. I, you know, Michael Dominic on Coda Radio was it was investigating Azure as his backend infrastructure, and for like two or three months. Microsoft just gave his company Azure cloud credits and just he was able to run an Azure for absolutely free. Of course, when those cloud credits ran up, it really didn't turn out to be that good of a deal. But you could see if you're an enterprise, someone comes along, you know, Microsoft could do the hard sell here and say, if you transition, uh, you know, XYZ, super important web backend app, maybe it's like it's like the backend infrastructure that does ad click tracking across millions of websites, right? Something really high end that uses a lot of input output from a database. Microsoft comes in and says, man, we'd love to have you on Azure. We'll give you Azure for free for a year. Why couldn't they do that? They absolutely could do that. They have an entire enterprise sales division that goes into companies and wines and dines. I've been there. I've been wined and dined. I know how it works. They sell, 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 sell. They bring you swag. They bring you experts. They bring in people to help you with the transition. They pay for things. I mean, it's amazing. And and, and then they're going to be able to. They're going to be able to. I mean, that's that's really when they go after Amazon that way. They're. I mean, Amazon's screwed. But you know, I'm yeah. well, maybe Amazon just transitions more to more of a casual developer kind of you know. So I don't know. We'll see. Maybe they'll continue to dominate. It's going to be fun to watch. It's all cloud gateway drug. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm just going to go set up a KVM box in my garage and <laughs> call it good. Uh, all right. So we can put down our Android pitchforks today. Trend Micro kind of got cut. Um, Stoking the fire here. So Trend Micro released a press release recently with bold claims saying that malware was running rampant throughout the Google Play Store. Um, This was on July 15th, 2014. They say Google Play is populated with fake apps. More than half of them carry malware. Potentially evil doppelgangers for some of the most popular apps are inundating the Google Play Store with many carrying malware, according to a new blog post by Trend Micro. And then, they, of course, this is in their own press release. A global developer of cybersecurity solutions is how they sign it. Uh, in the in the report, more than 77% of the top 50 apps on the Google Play Store have repackaged or fake apps associated with them. All right, that sounds pretty, pretty bad, pretty bad. Turns out, bogus. Yeah, it turns out uh, Trend Micro is slightly a little over-eager. Over, over eager. They're, they're the uh, eager badger here with their language. It turns out, guys... When they say from the Play Store, what they meant is side-loaded apps. <laughs> yeah, they didn't mean Play Store at all. So <laughs> that's not what, that's even yeah. close. Yeah, yeah, they, uh, yeah. It turns out uh, they were uh, they, the apps that were in question that they say had the malware were posted were analysis they'd run on apps outside the Play Store, and then when they when they did their numbers, they just mixed them all together. And when you account for the Play Store numbers, uh, it goes way, way down. There's still some bogus apps in the Play Store for sure, but it's like nowhere near 77%. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's like FUD spread at its worst. Yeah. And and so people were kind of scratching their head and, and were like, wait a minute here. This doesn't sound right. So they sent Trend Micro, uh, you know, a bunch of people sent them some tweets and, and emails being like, guys, can you check this? And so Trend Micro had to come out with a blog post and be like, uh, yeah. Are bad about that. <laughs> kind of, kind of funny. Oh gee, yeah. Trend Micro, you guys. I mean, it's just like saying uh, operating room isn't sterile because the trash can outside has bacteria in it. Well, and doesn't it just <laughs> confirm insane. something we've always known? Is that these uh, these antivirus uh, pro- uh, companies want to gin up a bunch of fear so that way they can sell more of their antivirus solutions? And it really comes down to them just trying to get people to, you know. Buy Trend Micro cybersecurity consulting services, or using an antivirus app on their Android phone, or maybe they're in the back room negotiating with Google on like some Play Store wide uh, Trend Micro scans. So they could put "certified by Trend Micro" on every Play page. Like, who knows what's going on here, right? Fear mongering and my and marketing. Yeah, that well, we do know it's definitely Problem. people looking for clicks. Problem oh, yeah. is, if they get that. Uh, press release wrong what else are they going to get wrong why would i trust them yeah, man. to provide with any services after that yeah yeah well and you know you, it's this the whole all these cyber threats and cyber security are all just a bunch of ginned up numbers like when uh when uh semantic went in front of congress and was telling congress about the level of cyber threat against america's businesses 
they were quoting like they they took their customer stats and they would quote every like they would include if a scanner found a bad cookie or you know you downloaded something it's your in your internet cache and you know nothing was ever infected but the scanner found it they were counting those in the attack incident numbers so they were reporting billions of attacks and the Congress is just like, oh my goodness, two billion attacks? Well, yeah, if you count every bad cookie and every malicious little thingy that downloads in people's cache and you spread it across all of Semantics users for the last 10 years, okay, maybe. All I have to say is that is a lot of porn ads. <laughs> hey oh, hey oh, hey! Somebody else who tells it like it is. Linus Torvalds came out, and uh, I don't know. Maybe you guys have followed the story. I just read it this morning, and it just kind of made me smile. Oh, this is hilarious. Linus says the GCC 4.9.0 seems to be terminally broken. Uh, slash dot article has, says a critique from Linus Torvalds of GCC 4.9.0 after a random panic was discovered in a load balance function in the Linux kernel. An email to Linux kernel email list outlining two separate but possibly related bugs. Linus describes the compiler as terminally broken. And worse, he says it's pure and utter S. Uh, here's, the, here's a quote from Linus. I love reading Linus quotes. Looky here. Your compiler does some absu- absolutely insane things like the sp- spilling, including spilling a constant. For Christ's sakes, the compiler shouldn't have been allowed to graduate from kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> he says, You're, this is your compiler creating completely broken code. We may need to add a warning to make sure nobody compiles with GCC 4.90. The Debian people should probably downgrade their shiny new compiler. Ouch. Wow. Oh, this is almost as bad as when he went off in NVIDIA. Yeah, I, I do love a good Linus rant. And I wonder why <laughs> I wonder why does it take all the way to getting to Linus before somebody says something? Why isn't somebody else in the chain saying something? It gets to Linus. And then if it's Linus that has to point it out, everybody hears about it. You know, if you, yeah. if you tackle yeah. this <laughs> stuff before it gets in front of them, nobody would know. And the BSD guys are already giving me a hard time about this one. They're already giving me a hard time about it. So fix your compiler. Don't make Linus grumpy. Hey, uh, tomorrow on the show, uh, Angela will be joining me for a special tech talk today. So I'd love to have you join us live. You know, we do it at 9 a.m. Pacific, noon Eastern, jblive.tv. And it's available for download shortly after that over at jupiterbroadcasting.com. And this is also a crowdfunding show. In fact, we're trying to add more crowdfunding to the network as a whole. So we set up patreon.com slash today. A page you can go pledge. I've put $3 in there, but any amount you can afford per month, more or less. And more always does help, of course. This is investing in our network. This is me saying, I want to keep a balance between ads and actual community contributions so that way we can stay weird, we can stay indie. I don't have to worry about things that you have to worry about when you have a lot of sponsors. I can focus on the content. Keep it lean, keep it mean. Patreon.com slash today. Help us invest in projects, hardware, emergencies, contractors, all of it right there. Become part of the Jupiter Broadcasting Network. You really would be helping quite a bit patreon.com slash today and thanks to all 274 of my patrons you guys rock so hard just so damn hard thanks guys oh uh just a quick plug too if you didn't get a chance to catch this sunday's linux action show episode 323 eric and i went down to oscon with noah and uh, had a great trip we'll tell you more about that on linux unplugged on tuesday but we got five really great interviews just in this episode of the Linux Action Show, 323, Chris Tabona, Karen Sander, uh, Christian Mil- uh, Hillman from the Mozilla Project. We got an interview with the LibreOffice group, played a little bit of that last week, but you can hear their answer about collaborative editing in LibreOffice in this episode of Linux Action Show. And we talked to Rackspace about how they're loving on CoreOS, an up-and-coming Linux distribution. So go check out Linux Action Show 323 if you haven't seen it yet. <laughs> Huge show. And then we'll have more interviews on Linux Unplugged on Tuesday. Isn't that ridiculous? Big big show. Big show. Big show. Uh, so, And I can't wait to talk more about our trip in uh, Linux Unplugged. All right, so this week, I'm going to... Uh, let me get rid of the show notes there. I thought, I don't know if you guys saw this, but IBM Watson's in the news again. I don't know if these are publicity stunts or what with Watson, but supposedly Watson's going to clean up the VA. And I thought, let's look back at IBM's role this week. So hopefully I'll be able to find enough clips. We'll wrap up every episode this week with a look back at IBM technology and for better or for worse, where it got us. We'll start this week with maybe one of their most successful inventions. I had one just for a tiny, tiny bit because it was given to me by my grandpa. I bet I would leave a comment wherever you're watching this. Have you ever used one of these? Here's a better way to put words on paper. 
a remarkable electric typewriter, the IBM Selectric. This is what makes it different, an ingenious printing element that works faster than the eye can see. Watch it in action. Now in slow motion, as it turns, tilts, prints. The IBM Selectric is versatile too. From many different snap-on, snap-off elements, you can select the best type style for the job and be ready to type again in seconds. The IBM Selectric, a typewriter so different, only the alphabet remains the same.